The journey so far has been hell, but worse is on the way. You worked your fingers to the bone to buy the ticket and cover the migration fees. You've kissed your family and friends goodbye and traveled over 3,000 miles from your home to the glistening jewel of the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, a city with a population of over 3.3 million people, but where nearly 80% are foreigners like you. You think a better life is waiting for you there. A good job with steady wages, housing provided, and bosses that care for and respect you. A way to finally escape your debts. But you're wrong. Horribly, horribly wrong. It doesn't seem so bad at first. You arrive at the luxurious Dubai International Airport, where someone representing your employer has a card with your name on it. They carry your bags to the car. They even take your passport from you for safekeeping. It's not like you'd ever want to leave, right? Dubai is the Las Vegas of the Middle East, after all, the place that dreams are made of. With a GDP of over $100 billion, it's a shining opulent city, home to impossible skyscrapers, vast displays of wealth, and it serves as a beacon of prosperity in the UAE. Maybe you're a part of the club now. But there's a dark secret under all this glitz and glamour. It's built on blood, sweat, and tears of people just like you. And now it's already too late to escape. Flash forward a month and the work you were doing back home feels like a treasured childhood memory. You're pouring cement at the base of another mega skyscraper project. The intense 110 degree heat is blistering your skin. The other poor souls around you work like robots, as cruel foremen in aviator glasses stare down at you with disgust. You're on the ninth hour of work for the day, so you've still got a few more before you collapse and get shoved with all the others into a filthy crowded bus and carted back to the hovels you call home. You'll sleep, maybe if your body can get used to the heat, but you won't feel rested by the time the foremen come back, ready to drag your sorry ass back to the construction site for another 12-hour shift. One of seven you go through every single week. Sometimes your fellow construction workers collapse from exhaustion. Some of them never get back up, worked to death like pack mules. It doesn't even phase you. After all, around 10 migrant workers die in the UAE every single week. They start to become the ones you envy the most. Once you had hopes and dreams of a better life, now you're just another Dubai slave. This might seem like a worst case scenario, but it is just the tip of the iceberg, as you'll see with some of even the more gut-wrenching details we'll be exposing. Dubai has a track record of luring migrant workers from around the world, but especially from countries throughout the Indian subcontinent, as well as from Asia and other parts of the Arab world. They're promised good jobs, fair wages, and a chance at a better life. But what they find couldn't be further from that. Take Farhan, a man in his early 30s who had been living in his home country of Pakistan before migrating to Dubai. Only 20% of the population in the city is native, with foreign workers from India and Pakistan totaling nearly 40%. But the ruling class lord over the foreign majority with an iron fist. Like many others, Farhan was lured to Dubai by the promise of high and steady wages. Corrupt work agencies that have direct ties to the United Arab Emirates will disseminate lies about lucrative paychecks and stability to bait people seeking to escape abject poverty in their home country, like Pakistan, where low-skilled workers can earn around $100 each month. The first step in the exploitation of Farhan and others like him came before he'd even departed from Pakistan, whereas he'd been expecting the company that hired him through the agency to cover the costs of his travel to the UAE. He was surprised to be told that he'd need to shoulder the financial responsibility himself, even though these exorbitant costs and visas should have been covered by the hiring company under Emirati law. Farhan was one of many migrants coerced into taking on the hefty task of raising enough funds to migrate to the UAE, requiring in excess of $2,000 to chase their dreams. Some hiring companies will agree to cover those initial recruitment fees only to force the employees to reimburse the company for those expenses should they resign, or if they're let go, and you thought your boss sucked. In other cases, companies hiring workers from outside of Dubai will withhold sums of money from their migrant workers' salaries to cover the recruitment fees. As Farhan would learn, the companies in Dubai had insidious ways of using debts or withholding money from their workers to keep them enslaved. Through these exploitative practices, those migrating to escape poverty are instead forced even deeper into the debt trap. In cases where the companies have covered the travel costs, it creates an immediate financial obligation that serves as a millstone around the necks of new workers, others who might be indebted to those they borrowed from to pay for travel or visas will find themselves struggling to send money home. 
and with slave wages once you're in, there's no way you can afford to get out. But back to Farhan, who is still sadly trying to get in. Like many others, Farhan was plunged into a desperate scramble to acquire enough funding to leave for the UAE. He started talking to family and friends, anyone and everyone he knew, that he could ask for a loan. Farhan was barely able to scrape enough money together to cover his travel and visa. But the way he saw it, he would easily make that money back in wages once he started working. Low-skilled workers can earn up to $1,000 monthly in Dubai. Farhan could support his family, build a better life, and escape, finally, the clutches of poverty that had enveloped his life. But the moment Farhan arrived in the UAE, that same bait that had drawn him in and many others, was quickly snatched away. His new employer seized and confiscated his passport upon arrival in the country, denying him from obtaining an exit visa and effectively imprisoning him in Dubai. Farhan and the others were now beholden to their employers, rendered vulnerable without any legal power to assert their rights. From the moment they set foot on Emirati soil, Farhan and many other hopeful migrant workers suddenly found themselves unable to leave. Then the real nightmare started. Now before we get into Farhan's hellish new life, you might be wondering how this is even possible in the modern world. Well, it's thanks to the Kafala system. Kafala is a labor framework built on the idea of sponsorships, meaning that migrant workers become tied legally to their employers. This means that the companies get a terrifying level of control over the employees' lives, including dictating their immigration status and ability to reside in Dubai, granting or denying work permits, and often their living conditions too. The laws and policies of the Kafala system also give employing companies the right to control whether or not their migrant workers are permitted to exit the UAE. There are no legal protections in place for these workers, and if they try to complain, there will be hell to pay. And as if that all wasn't bad enough, they can't even leave their employment without facing legal and financial ramifications. The Kafala system dials the normal imbalance of power between an employer and their employee up to 11. Under this system, workers are literally forced into labor against their will, and this is particularly prevalent in the United Arab Emirates' construction, domestic, and service sectors. People who migrate to Dubai and find themselves employed by businesses in these industries are made to work without breaks and for severely limited pay. In particular, migrant women often face the danger of physical abuse at the hands of their employers after many of them are lured into the UAE by recruitment agents, only for these women to be sold by the hiring companies into forced domestic work. Naturally, this draconian system has been widely criticized for opening the door to worker exploitation and the abuse of migrants' rights. Numerous allegations of forced labor arose during the construction of the Dubai Expo in 2020, as well as during the Expo itself. There were several indications that workers from places such as India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Kenya, and Pakistan, who were working at the Expo, had their passports confiscated by their employers. These same workers, according to the allegations, were being forced to work unreasonably long hours and had to return to living in labor camps following the end of their shifts. The evidence of migrant workers being forced to work in exploitative conditions extends far beyond a single expo in 2020, though. In fact, it's widespread across the entire UAE. But Kafala has been made so integral to the labor structure of the UAE that there are hardly any options for foreign workers who find themselves being exploited by it. They're left unable to reach any kind of official government support and cut off from family back in their home countries, meaning that with no one else to turn to, they are completely beholden to the whims of their employers. While they make up to 88% of the workforce, migrant workers are unable to raise complaints, vocalize grievances, or protest against their mistreatment, and instead are subjected to working conditions that are so poor it's an affront to even the basic levels of human dignity. Unable to leave, Farhan came to realize the truth, that the high wages and lifestyle he'd been sold were a lie. The promise of decent wages could not have been any less true. He'd only been making the equivalent of $175 per week. His employer demanded that he work 12 hours a day, 7 days a week, and if that wasn't bad enough, the company had denied him any way to legally leave the country. Once this had been made clear to Farhan, he was forced onto a bus crammed full of other people who'd migrated from Pakistan and across India, tricked by the same promises that had been made to him. Little did Farhan realize at the time, these people were soon to become his neighbors. They were taken far to the outskirts of the large shining city that had been built by slaves just like Farhan and the others on board. 
The bus took them to a small village, though to call it a village is pretty generous. The buildings were home to shabby dormitories, yellow concrete walls that were quickly packed full of workers as they were herded off the bus and told to find themselves a place to sleep. There were metal bunk beds scattered around, though hardly enough for the nearly 100 people who were now filing into the rooms. Prisoners get better accommodations than this. Aside from the cramped living quarters, there was a large communal kitchen, one that would become a hive of activity over the coming months, with hardly enough space to accommodate the people now forced to cook and eat there. Outside, the area was fenced off, guarded by security who had been hired by the same company that was now using Faran and a number of the others as a workforce. This was not a village, it was a labor camp. Faran had now found himself living in what was almost a ghetto, a neighborhood of camps that was intentionally kept hidden away from the prying eyes of Emirati citizens and Western tourists. They were all too captivated by Dubai's shining skyscrapers and huge mega malls to take the trip through the desert to see how the people who built those structures were forced to live. The next 10 years would be a living nightmare for Faran. The company that recruited Faran put him to work on construction sites, spending exhaustive days building the skyscrapers that dominated the Dubai skyline. Sites like that of the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, had become symbols of the luxury life that was kept out of reach to Faran and many other migrant workers. Sometime around 2011, 10 months after the famed hotel was opened, a man jumped from the building's 147th floor. He had been an expatriate like Faran, only this man had come from India. He was a cleaner who had been denied a holiday request and took his own life as a direct result of the cruelty and exploitation he had suffered since coming to Dubai. The Indian consulate revealed shortly after that at least two Indian expatriates end their own lives per week in Dubai. Back in 2005 alone, there were over 970 deaths of Indian nationals in Dubai, and those were just the deaths that were reported. The consulate general confirmed that most of them were migrant workers forced into blue-collar jobs by their employers. When this information, in particular the death toll among Indian migrant workers from 2005, was made public, Emirati authorities took immediate action, by which we mean they demanded that the consulate stop recording and reporting on the deaths of those workers. And in the UAE, when the authorities make a demand, it's advisable to follow it to the letter. Naturally, one might assume that slavery, by its very definition, entails not providing a person with any pay at all for their labor. But this is where a loophole in the kafala system comes into play. Migrant workers technically are paid wages for the work they carry out, but they simultaneously are not. One of the tactics employed by UAE companies that makes use of foreign workers is to keep their wages from them, leaving them vulnerable and at their employer's mercy. By keeping these migrant employees on the hook for what paltry income they've earned, large companies can keep them in a perpetual state of indentured servitude. As shocking as it might be, some workers like Ferran are made to wait months to receive payment for their labor, which isn't just a violation of their rights as workers and as human beings, but it's also an insidious way of keeping them working for the company. Technically, wages are being issued for the shifts that these migrant workers are completing. Those wages just aren't being paid out as they should be. You'd assume that if the company that employed Ferran and the others in his labor camp were withholding wages, they would organize and lobby some kind of mass complaint or even go on strike. Conveniently, the UAE bans trade unions, which inhibits workers' rights to receive stronger labor laws and rights. With so many migrants already in dire financial situations after the high cost of migrating to Dubai, withholding wages not only keeps these workers in mounting debt but also denies any due compensation for the back-breaking number of hours they are made to work. This lack of payment can accumulate over the months, and the longer that employers keep withholding workers' salaries and forcing them to keep suffering through long shifts of unpaid labor, the worse their debt can become. Many like Faran travel to Dubai, intending to send a portion of their wages back to their family in their home countries, to also lift them out of poverty. But with access to their earnings cut off by their employers, those good intentions become impossible to achieve. For Ferran, this was the entire reason he embarked on his journey out of Pakistan, to financially support his mother, father, and siblings back home. Now facing all this adversity, the thought of returning home had crossed Ferran's mind many times. His passport was still in the hands of his employers, but he'd cover the costs of traveling to Dubai. Surely, if he kept working, as grueling and hard as it would be, he'd be able to raise enough funds to get home. 
In reality, that plan was as much of a pipe dream as the one he'd been promised before arriving in Dubai. Enshrined as part of the Emirati Kafala system is a certain clause in the contract that migrant workers are made to sign. This part of their agreement with the employer legally entitles them to a large final payout to cover the costs of flights back to their home country. This carrot and stick is used by companies in the UAE to keep expatriates working despite the low wages, tiring and even dangerous work, and the poor quality of living conditions. It's insidious that this promise of one day being able to return home, of putting an end to the day-to-day -day nightmare of working in Dubai, is used to keep workers in line. Instead of working together to organize industrial action, such as walkouts or strikes for better pay and fairer treatment, they instead have to cling to what little hope they have and continue enduring the hardship of being a modern-day wage slave. The alternative? Leaving Dubai on foot and walking home through the desert, where the heat of 122 degrees Fahrenheit makes survival infeasible. So Farhan and his fellow workers have little choice other than to slave away for 12 hours every day, waiting for their last payment, if it ever comes. But given everything you've learned here, do you really fancy his chances? Now check out the horrible life of an average Roman Empire slave, or watch this instead.